go there, you'll find free courses, lots of listening practice, grammar exercises, and we also have a newsletter every two weeks with different uh, levels of English that you can use to practice. And with me today uh, for the first time is Kevin from DeliberateEnglish.com. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. Hey, Craig. Nice to be here. Great to have you on because, uh, well, for various reasons, but one reason, Kevin is originally from Chicago. He's a business English teacher based in Chicago, Illinois. So you're going to hear, apart from my London accent, you're also going to listen to Kevin speaking a Midwestern uh, American English. And uh, Kevin's website is definitely worth looking at, deliberateenglish.com. Kevin, if people go to your website, what can they find there? How can you help people with their business English? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my focus, as you mentioned, is helping people build their confidence when they're speaking at work. So whether that's to try to get a better job, whether that's to feel more confident in their current job, I want to basically help you be able to improve your, your work life and your economic life. And so if you go to deliberateenglish.com, you'll be able to, to grab a free copy of my ebook, Three Steps to Confidently Express Yourself at Work. And that'll teach you really what are some of the most important things you need to do when you're practicing your English so that you're able to use all this vocabulary that's floating in your head when you're having a real conversation with someone. I mean, Craig, you probably get people that say all the time, like, hey, I understand words. I understand these things, but I can't use them. I can't remember them when I'm actually talking to someone. And so that's what my ebook is all about, is trying to help you take things from that passive memory where you can understand and move them to an active memory where you can actually use them in a conversation. Right. And I think you've kind of got a personal connection to that, right? Because you do speak Spanish and you've been learning Spanish for a few years. And was there a time when you when you started learning Spanish that you realized you had to change from being a passive learner to an active learner? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, when, when I first started to, to study Spanish, I had no idea how to learn a language. I, I had never done it before. Um, so I started just by using like free apps, answering questions, got me some basic vocabulary. And then I started trying to just, like you said, like passively listen to some music and, and some TV shows. And so I, I started to, to feel like, okay, maybe, maybe I know what I'm doing. Um, but the first time I went to Spain, like five years ago, um, I walked into this restaurant. Um, I asked for a table for two. It worked. I was like, okay, good. This is, this is going good. Um, but then when we sit down and, and the waitress walks up to us and starts talking to me, it was just like, oh, I have no idea what she just said. I have no idea how to respond. I feel so like uh, uncomfortable right now. Yeah. And, and so that was really a big, um, what we say, what we call sometimes a wake up call. So a big moment for me that showed me, hey, I, I need to change something here in the way I'm practicing in order to actually be a speaker of this language and not just being able to answer some, some quiz questions about it. I heard you say on, on a podcast, and I love this quote, so I'm going, I might steal it from you. You said <laughs> you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable when you learn a new exactly. language. Exactly. And I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, for example, when I'm, when I'm working with students in the deliberate English community, when we do live classes, I don't tell them ahead of time exactly what they're going to talk about. So when we go into a class, I say, hey, we're going to talk about some, some business co concepts today. I'm going to give you a topic to discuss. But then when they're live, that's when they get the specific topic. And so then they are forced to, to improvise, right, to, to think about what they want to say. Um, and then we'll work on that directly. We'll give them feedback, give them a commentary on, on how they're doing. But the point is, yeah, the point of this class, sure, is, is to learn some, some vocab. But for me, the, the main purpose is to really get you comfortable in uncomfortable, uncomfortable situations. Being uncomfortable, it's, yeah. Exactly. And it's hard sometimes, even when you're, an, you're speaking your language, your, your own native language, it's hard when you meet new people and you're in a mm -hmm. social situation. It's hard sometimes. I get shy. I get nervous. And when mm -hmm. it's your second language, the language you're learning, it's even more difficult. Let's yeah. uh, let's let's say hello quickly to people who are joining us sure. live. Hey, D from Buenos Aires. Good to have you. Good to see you here. Norma again. Hello. Gemma, lovely to see you. Um, who else do we have? Orval. 
Mika, Katia from Costa Rica. Good to see you here. And Gustavo and uh, Consuelo. So thank you to everybody who is joining us live. Um, we're live here with Kevin from DeliberateEnglish.com. And the focus today is on business English. And of course, if you're watching the replay, thank you for, for spending some time with us. Now, Kevin, before we look at the 10 expressions that we've got today, um, mm -hmm. from your experience, what's the biggest mistake that you think business English students make um, thinking perhaps they go for a job interview or mm -hmm. they're in meetings? Is there one particular thing that stands out to you that's very prominent with, with learners of English in business? Yeah, so if we look at the the job interview specifically, one of the things that I see people have problems with, and, and this is both native English speakers and, and English students alike, is that when people ask you about your job experience, what we typically tend to talk about is just the tasks that we did at our job. So you might say something like, yeah, I, I worked at a call center and I talked to clients. Okay, cool. You're, you're describing what that job was. You're giving me the job description. But what you're not doing is telling me what you did. What, 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 did, what did you do that made this successful? How did you help this company? What was unique about you? And so what I try to encourage my students to, to thought, talk more about when they're in that job interview situation is to not talk about tasks, but to talk about outcomes or results? What were the results that you helped either directly or as part of a team achieve? So with that call center example, instead of saying, I worked at a call center and talked to clients, you might say, hey, I helped my call center increase customer satisfaction by 15%. And mm -hmm. so now if I'm the person interviewing you, that gives me some really interesting information. I see that, hey, you were part of a successful team. You know how to work in a team. You, you maybe even achieved the same goal that I'm trying to achieve. Maybe my goal is to increase customer satisfaction too. And now you know what it's like. I can see that you were a part of that. And so just by changing our language a little bit, by changing our focus a little bit to talk more about the result as opposed to just, here's the list of things I had to do, yeah. you can make a big difference in the way that people perceive you and stand out or be more interesting as a candidate. And of course, the implication there with I've raised sales or I've raised profits by 15%, the implication or the, the meaning behind that is I can do the same or better for you. So it's what I can give you that should be the focus, not what you can do for me, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the interviewer is trying to see, hey, is this person going to be a fit for my company? Like, if you just say, hey, I, I worked there, I worked in sales, okay, everyone can say that. But yeah. were you actually successful with it, right? Did, did you actually see some results that are meaningful for me that I want to be able to have happen in my company? And so, you know, uh, people that are listening to this might think too, like, oh, well, you know, I'm in a job, I, I'm not in sales, I don't have specific numbers. Um, but I mean, everyone has some sort of, you know, project that they had to work on. Um, everyone has some sort of you know, team quotas or goals, right? Hey, you need to make sure that uh, we, we get orders out on time, right? Or we need to reduce the number of complaints or refund requests. And so it doesn't have to be your specific, like, hey, I personally sold a million dollars, but just think about what you and your team accomplished together, right? Because that's still very valuable to me as someone interviewing you to know what did you achieve, not just what were you told to do. Gotcha. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, one final thing before we start our 10 um, expressions, Kevin, can you quickly tell everybody about the three steps to confidently express yourself at work, which seems to me like a very interesting thing to know about? Sure. Yeah. So that's, that's all what I cover in that ebook that I mentioned uh, earlier. If you go to deliberateenglish.com, you can get a free copy of it. And the three steps are really meant to tell you, hey, there are some parts of your studying that you're doing right now that aren't helping you improve as quickly as you need to or help you remember words in a conversation. And so this goes back to that problem of active versus passive practice. And so if you're just watching a lot of TV, watching a lot of, or listening to a lot of music, and that's the main way you practice, that's a very passive way of practicing. And so when you hear new things, it's like, 
it, it goes over your head, it disappears, your brain ignores it. And so what I talk about is those three steps it is a simple process of collect, use, and get feedback, and then we repeat. So in the collect step, I give tips and advice on how can we more actively consume this content that we're watching so that when we hear a new word, it doesn't just disappear right away. And then when we're talking about using, what are some ways I can actively practice using this, not just in a conversation with a real human, but also when I'm practicing by myself. And then finally, where and how to get the feedback we need so that we know that we're using these expressions correctly so that you're confident enough to use them the next time you talk to someone. Okay. Thank you. So go over and have a look at that ebook, sign up for it especially if you need English for business, if you're working in business, if you're looking for, for jobs and you want to brush up or improve your business English, go and take a look at that. Now, to our 10 natural business meeting expressions. We're going to look at 10 expressions that you could use in a business meeting or pretty much in most formal situations, right, Kevin? That's right. Yeah. yeah. There's plenty of uses for these, both in, in real life, regular life, and business life, for sure. And lots more people are joining us. Mary, Andres, Eduardo, Pache, Vicente, Gustavo. If you have any questions while we're presenting these expressions, if something's not clear, if you want to practice these expressions in a sentence, type them in the, in the chat, and we'll bring them up on the screen and help you with your English. So I think it's you to kick off or start. Okay. Kevin, <laughs> what's the first one we've got on the list? So the first one that I want to talk about is why don't we table that for now? Why don't we table that? So if you table something, that doesn't mean you're going to put it on a table. <laughs> it means that you're going to delay talking about something until a future time. It's so table is a, as a verb, right? Yeah, exactly. It's table as a verb. And so this is a really good way if you're in a meeting and you want to keep people focused on a specific topic, right? Like maybe we're here today. Oh, let's take this meeting, for example. We're here today to talk about business expressions. Well, if Craig says, hey, let, let's talk about cooking recipes, I might say, <laughs> hey, Craig, really cool idea. I like it. But why don't we table that for now so we can focus on the business expressions? We'll talk. Hey, about Kevin, how, how are the Chicago Cubs doing lately? <laughs> are they winning? What's going on Great with the question, Cubs? But why don't we why don't we table that for now, Craig? Why don't we table okay. that for now? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it means like, hey, we'll talk about that later because we need to focus on other things now. So another example sentence is like if we're in a formal meeting, I might say, hey, I agree that that's an important topic but let's table it for now. We still need to finish today's agenda, right? Um, another example could be like, hey, I think we need to table any discussion about taxes until after the election, right? We need to see what happens with the election before we can figure out our taxes. So those are all different ways to use table. Like I said, it's a great way to tell someone, let's pause that topic, let's talk about it. We're getting some questions coming in in the chat. For example, Gustavo is asking us about the words win, gain, and earns. Gustavo, let's table that for now because today we're focusing on business English expressions. But I will write that down at the end of this stream and um, we'll look at it in a different, uh, another week. We'll focus on that. And um, we've got another question here from Juan Frank uh, Chavez. Um, yeah, present simple. We could do that another week, but we'll table it for now, Juan Frank, and we'll look at it in a different uh, a different stream. Exactly. So, Perfect examples. Perfect examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're tabling those questions. But if you have any specific questions about these expressions, we'll be we won't table them. We'll be more than happy to address them uh, during this this stream. Exactly. So, um, and one thing you mentioned earlier, Craig, that I want to re encourage people about is, uh -huh. you know, let's, let's keep this interactive. And, you know, when you think about collect, use, get feedback, so we're helping you collect some expressions right now, but now is a good chance in the chat to try using it, right? So try to use this expression table in a sentence. And as Craig and I are going through the, the next uh, set of expressions, if we see a good um, sentence or two using some of these expressions, we'll, we'll put it on the screen and we'll give you some comments on if it makes sense, did you use it correctly, or if there are any small changes we need to make. 
Absolutely. Now, um, when you see this expression or hear this expression, I didn't catch that. That's not Kevin talking about baseball. Again, that's that's when you don't understand something or you don't maybe you don't hear it or you didn't understand the meaning of something. So you probably could say um, sorry or pardon or um, what, which is not very polite in a business situation. But I didn't catch that is a very common expression when you want somebody to repeat something and being hey, Craig, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't listening. I didn't catch that. Could you say it again? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't catch that is another way of saying, can you repeat what you said? And because we like to be so polite, we would sometimes apologize before we use that expression. So we might say, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Or, I'm afraid I didn't catch that. So that's a, a useful expression. You can use it in an exam. For example, if you're doing a Cambridge exam or an IELTS exam and you're speaking and you want repetition, then just say, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Or I'm afraid I didn't quite catch that. You can put that word quite in as a modifier to make it even more polite. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Yeah. And I would say, too, to, to me, that sounds way more natural than saying, hey, could you please repeat that? Could you repeat yes. that? Right. Yeah. Or sometimes I hear as an examiner, repeat, please. <laughs> it's just, no. Yeah, no, it's much nicer to, to use an expression like that. And notice the intonation. I'm sorry. I didn't quite catch that. Notice that intonation and make sure um, that you're using polite intonation with it as well. Okay, and the next one, I think, is back to you, Kevin. Perfect. Um, so my next expression is, let's take this offline, specifically that offline part. And so when we take something offline, it means that we want to talk about a topic privately instead of in a big meeting. So if, again, we're, we're talking in this meeting right now, Craig says, you know, hey, Kevin, um, I was looking at some of your previous uh, your podcasts and you were talking about um, being in a band. Um, can you give me some some tips on starting my own band? <laughs> I'd say, you know, hey, let's let's take this offline. Right. No, but nobody's here to listen to our music right now. Um, <laughs> so it's 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 similar to tabling something, but tabling is only let's talk about it in the future. If we're saying take something offline, it means I want to talk about it privately with you instead of in a large meeting. So if we're in a business meeting with like 15 people and we're talking about you know sales numbers, for example, um, and then someone ta asks me about, hey, let's talk about this next event we're planning. I might say, hey, let's take the event details offline. Not everybody on this call needs to hear all of them, right? So I'm saying... Let's talk about it privately. This is not the time. We don't need 15 people watching us as we talk about this. Yeah, that's clear. Um, one question we've got, or one comment we've got from Eduardo, who says he thinks he should table his English for a different life. Now, come on, Eduardo. Your English is very, very good. You are a regular attendee, a regular person in this live stream. You don't need to table your English. You're doing fine. Well, I'll, I'll also say that if you're capable of making jokes in English, that already shows that you're you've got a nice <laughs> level. So good job, I love it. <laughs> Eduardo is a funny guy. Could you say that again? I didn't get what you said. That's also a very nice way of asking for repetition. Well done, Eduardo. Um, hi, Asmo. Good to see you here. Cloudcom, good to see you back again as well. Uh, nice example from Cloudcom. Let's talk about the salary offline. Yeah, very good. Excellent. The only thing I would say on that one is. If you're going to say the salary, that means that we're already talking about like a specific conversation or specific salary. If you're just talking about in general, like, hey, you know, we're, we're planning to post a job and we don't have any numbers yet. Like, let's just get rid of the the. We would just say, hey, let's talk about salary offline. Let's talk about salary. But if Craig and I were, were negotiating and I'm like, Craig, I, I, I need... Uh, to put fifty thousand more dollars on this this job, um, he might say, "Okay, let's talk about the salary, that specific salary offline." So, if mm -hmm. we're being specific, the salary. If we're being more general, just say, "Let's talk about salary offline." Okay. Um, 
back to me, I think. Um, now, can I come in here? That's not somebody waiting outside in the street and asking to come into your house. Can I come in here is when you want to interrupt. So you'd use that for interruption. Imagine you're sitting around a big business table. There's a meeting in English. You want to say something and you're not sure how to interrupt. You wait for somebody to take a breath, somebody who's speaking. <sighs> Can I come in here? Then you speak in that little gap when someone <gasps> breathes. And that's a way of you preempting or beginning your interruption. Can I come in here? I'd like to say that. Um, where's my example? Um, yeah. Or excuse me, can I come in here? I want to add that. Excuse me, can I come in here? I want to say that. So again, that would be a good way of interrupting. Um, hey, Craig, in the, um, in could, I, could I come in here? Sure, Kevin. Uh, I just want to say that your blue shirt, your blue shirt is amazing. I really Thank love you. It. It's it's an audio editing shirt. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, this is a wave. I do like the waveform. Yeah. Do you know what it is though? Do you know what it what what it what it is? What the sound is? No. What is yeah. it? It's um, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I have to edit out when I'm editing audio. Um, uh, or, um, mm. yeah, that's what it is. Um, comments from Erasmo. Hi, Erasmo. My English has been improving a lot by listening to Craig and Razor's book. Thank you, Erasmo. I know you are a listener. And it's it's nice of it's nice to know that you're listening and that you've come here also for our live stream tonight to let you listen to to an American accent as well as mine every week. Uh, yeah. yeah. However, um, in the interest of time, I think we should continue to the next one. <laughs> exactly. So the next one is in the interest of time, which Craig just used beautifully. And so this is a way that you can sort of introduce or make a suggestion about what to do next in a meeting when you know there's not a lot of time left or you're trying to make sure we finish sooner. So like Craig just said, hey, in the interest of time, let's move to the next one. So what he's saying is, hey, I don't want this, this class to last forever. So I want to keep things moving forward. In the interest of time, let's talk about X, Y, Z, whatever. And so another example is maybe you're in a meeting, you look at the clock and you say, oh, there's, there's only 15 minutes left. So you could say, hey, we only have about 15 minutes left. So in the interest of time, let's review everyone's action items. And action items is a little bonus word there too. Action items means like tasks, the tasks that someone has to do after a meeting. So with this sentence, I'm saying, hey, I want to make sure that we finish this meeting on time. So in the interest of time, let's skip ahead or let's focus on reviewing all the tasks or action items that everybody needs to do. Okay. And in the interest of time, we'll continue to our next um, expression, which is for clarification. So clarification is the noun when you want to clarify something, that's the verb, or to make it clear or clearer. And this is very useful, especially if you're in a meeting and everybody's speaking quickly in English and you think you understand, but you want to rephrase what you think somebody's said to make it absolutely clear or ask somebody to tell you again so that you have it absolutely clear in your mind what you've, what you've heard. For example, I'm sorry, could you please clarify what you said about next week's objectives? Objectives. So you think you've understood what's been said to you, but you just want the person to repeat it again so that you, you have it absolutely clear in your mind. Um, for example, uh, Kevin, you said on a podcast, when you're on a podcast with Kim, mm -hmm. that everyday life in countries like Spain is very different from life in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Could you please clarify what you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, so one easy example there, Craig, is that everything in Spain is much later than in Chicago. When I was in Spain, we would wake up at like 9 or 10. We'd have lunch at 2 in the afternoon and dinner at 10 p.m. But here in Chicago, we start at like 8 and lunch is at 11 and dinner's at like 6. So there you go. I'm clarifying what I meant by that previous statement. Um, I also have a clarification question for you, Craig, that came yes. in from, from my uh, YouTube live over here, sure. from Andres. 
Uh, he asks, could I use I didn't catch that to replace I didn't understand? What do you think? Yeah, I think you I think you could in, in an exam you could. Um although if you're for example, if you're in a complicated business meeting, then you do not necessarily want the person to repeat exactly what they've said. Sometimes you want them to expand on it and you want more detail and you want mm. them to paraphrase it, give you the information in a different way. Whereas if you're in like a B2 Cambridge um, first, B2 first test, an oral test, a speaking test, then you could use that as a way of, of repetition. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Can, can you repeat it? You don't necessarily need them to explain something complicated. You just want them to say it again. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. Do you agree when with you that? Say, yeah, when you say, I didn't understand, you're basically inviting the other person to give you more information about that topic. Versus if you just say, I didn't catch that, you're basically asking them to just repeat it. So if you want more information, then yeah, say, I, I didn't understand. But if you don't need more information, you just really didn't hear what they said the first time, then say, I didn't catch that. Yeah. Uh, Klaukam has a lovely sentence here using both <laughs> expressions. Could you please clarify, be careful of the word order with the indirect question, Klaukam. You've begun there an indirect question with could you please? So it's not a direct question. You need to change the position of the verb is. So could you please clarify what the image on your T-shirt is? So you take the verb to be and you put it at the end. Um, I didn't catch. I didn't catch it. Yeah, it's um, a, a wave file. When you record your voice, you see the wave go up and down and up and down on your voice. And I edit podcasts professionally, so I'm very used to seeing the wave file, and sometimes I can identify the words from the form of the wave. And this is from a friend of mine who sent me this T-shirt, who I work for. He's my boss, and it says um because I constantly remove um from the podcast when people say um, um, um. So that's what it is, Cloudcam. I got one more um, comment over here from Andres. Um, so he, he was giving a sample sentence using offline. So he says, hey, let's talk about personal projects offline. I think that's a perfect use of it because, hey, yep. if you're in a big business meeting, it's probably not the right time to talk about personal things. So you're saying, hey, let's talk about that privately. So very nice. Yeah. Um, just before we move on, because you were talking about the differences between Chicago and, and Spain, do you think you could live in Spain permanently or would this laid back, relaxed lifestyle drive you crazy? No, I, I could definitely live there. <laughs> oh, I like the I like the relayed back laid back. I just lifestyle. wanted to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect clarification. No, I would love it. We're we're too um we, we say high strung sometimes. We're we're too focused on work here and, and too focused on you know timeliness and deadlines where I would like to relax a little more. Yeah. To your point, um, I want to agree with you that I think the American lifestyle, and I love visiting America, but I think the American lifestyle can be quite hectic and quite intense. So to your point is is the next um, mm -hmm. – oh, no, that's yours, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, but I've, you I've used stolen, it perfectly. I've no, stolen no. your expression. I apologize. It was a great expression. So as, as everyone just saw, you use to your point – to refer to something someone said previously in a meeting that you want to agree with and add extra information to. So what Craig just said is, hey, Kevin, to your point about the Spanish lifestyle versus the American lifestyle, um, you know, I, I like it better here, right? So he added more information. So this happens a lot. We use this a lot in business meetings, especially if we're having like a conversation back and forth with someone or with a client where, hey, they said something earlier and I want to agree with it. So I might say, um, or let's, let's imagine we're in a meeting and somebody says, hey, we need to find a way to help more people. We need to find a way to help our business help more people. And so I might say in response, you know, that's 100% correct. And to your point, the more we invest in marketing, the more clients will be able to help, right? Because the more marketing we do, the more people know us, the more we can help them. 
So what I'm saying here is I am agreeing with the comment somebody just made about we need to help more people. And then I'm adding more information to it about how we can help more people by investing more in marketing. So if I've understood correctly, Kevin, you're saying that you can use that expression to the point to refer back to what somebody said and focus on the point that they've just made. Yeah, if exactly. I've understood, if I've understood correctly. Now, this you is another <laughs> another very useful expression if you want to clarify something or paraphrase something, because I do this often in Spanish. If I'm in a meeting or if I'm speaking to somebody about something important, the doctor, for example, <laughs> then I want to make sure I've understood the instructions or the information perfectly. So I often repeat back to the person what I think the person has said so you're you're checking with the person that you have understood correctly so if you use this at the beginning and then you just summarize or paraphrase what the person said to you so if i've understood correctly doctor i have to take this medication twice a day for three weeks mm -hmm. and then he says yeah. this or no and corrects you and i, I would add here too that this is an extremely useful phrase and strategy when you're talking to a client as well or if you're you know anytime you're dealing with somebody who's you know either a client or someone who's maybe even mad about something because this is a good way to show the other person that you were listening and that you're trying to understand them so you can repeat something back like hey craig if i understood you correctly you want to get rid of erm from your <laughs> from your recordings right so i'm repeating back i'm showing that i was actually listening and paying attention so this is a great phrase and a great strategy when you want to make sure that your your client your customer or someone who's maybe complaining about something that you're paying attention and that you're going to help them solve their problem yeah exactly here's another example for you let me check if i've understood you correctly is the deadline next Tuesday or next Thursday? Sometimes students confuse those two days of the week. So you want to make sure you've got the right date. So if I've understood you correctly, it's next Tuesday, right? And you can use that to, to check things. Um, so Craig, if I could come in here. <laughs> yes. I do have another comment over here on YouTube, um, another sample sentence. So he says, I was hearing the speech can i come in here with some other ideas so i would use one... past simple yeah i heard it i i heard the speech can you repeat well, it, it again Kevin? sure and i think it depends on what you're trying to say right so if you say and this is where to me one of the red flags popped up so he says i was hearing the speech can i come in here with some other ideas if you're talking about something you're actively paying attention to you should use listening, right? right? So I was listening to the speech. And so now can I come in here with some other ideas? But if you're taking it a different way, like Craig was mentioning, you could use that past simple, right? Say, hey, hey, I heard the speech in the past. Can I talk about it now, right? So heard is more about, you know, you're, you're noticing the sounds, right? Or it's something that happened well in the past. But if we're talking about, hey, I'm actively listening and paying attention, we would probably say listening. Would you agree, Craig? Absolutely. And as regular listeners to the podcast know, don't forget that preposition after listen. It's a lot of Spanish speakers do forget that. And we have a lot of Spanish um, uh, speakers listening and watching to, or not watching to, listening to this live stream. So remember to use the preposition to after the verb listen. Hi, Christine. Good to see you here. And Eduardo has a question. How many times hmm, do you think you need to use a word or expression to make them part of your active vocabulary? Good question, Eduardo. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, have an, uh, I have an opinion on this, and then I'm interested to hear your opinion too, Craig. Um, in, in my opinion, there's not a specific number. It's not like, hey, use it five times and then you're done. It, it's more about building a point of reference or creating a point of reference or some sort of connection to that word. And so I'll give you an example. Like when I was in Spain, I was in Spain a, a few weeks ago for a, for a trip and we were doing some, some cooking right, as part of like a cooking workshop. And I don't talk a lot about cooking in Spanish. So there was a lot of new words for me. And one of them that I still just can't forget. I, I heard it once, I used it once, and now it's just in my brain was dorarse. 
right? Like to make something golden, like cocina lo hasta que se dore, right? Until it until it uh, is golden. Mm -hmm. I, I I used it once, and now I remember it because I built a point of connection, right? I was in that moment. I connected it to an idea. I was doing it at the time. Um, so it's it's kind of more about building a point of reference to something and using it in a way that's meaningful to your brain. Because if your brain thinks something's useless, it's going to ignore it. And so that's where if you're only just like reviewing a, a one flashcard that has the word and the definition, that's telling your brain this is boring, this is not very useful. But if you can put yourself in situations, whether that's in, in classes or a community or whatever, where we're practicing real life situations where you even get to try using it in a real life situation, you're far more likely to remember that expression in a shorter amount of time than if you're just, again, looking at a word and a definition. What, what do you think, Craig? I agree with you. And I want to ask you about that, that example you gave about dorar or dorarse when you're speaking about making something golden. Because when I look at the word dorar and golden or gold, there, there isn't much of a connection there for me. One word, how do I link that word with what I know as to be golden? In English, did you have a picture in your mind? How, what do you think made you remember that word, whereas other words you might forget? Any idea? And I think it's because I, I was literally doing it because we were cooking meat at the time, right? And so you're going to cook it until it gets that golden brown color on the outside, and that's when you know it's done. And so I think for me, it was just I was literally doing the activity as I heard it, as I used it, and that image just got burned into my brain because <laughs> it was a, <laughs> it was a real thing. My brain saw, Hey, this is, this is something you're doing. This is something we need to know. As opposed mm -hmm. to if I just saw it in a list of vocab of a hundred useful cooking expressions, that means nothing to me. That means nothing to my brain. And I'm not showing my brain that this is important. So it was the context, the physical context of seeing it in action. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I don't remember my, mobile phone number which is crazy because i've had the number for many many years and i think it's just not important enough for me to remember because it's so easy to just look on the phone which is very lazy of me but um if i hear a word in spanish that i haven't heard before and i like it maybe it's an idiom maybe, maybe it's an expression and i really like it then i tend to remember it because because i like it so my advice would, would be, Eduardo, if you see any of these expressions from this 10, these 10 that we're talking about today, if one or two or three of them grab your attention because you think, oh, I didn't know that, that could be useful, write it down, practice it, and try and use it as soon as possible because the more you use it, Eduardo, the, more you, the quicker you incorporate it into your English vocabulary, then the easier easier it will be to remember. So well, and Craig, actually, words. Yeah. Erasmo has a comment that I think is very related to this that you could pull up. Um, so what do you think about using Anki? Anki is an app that you can use for, for free where you can basically create sort of virtual flashcards. And so to, to your point, to your point. To your point. <laughs> very good. To your point, Craig. If you're hearing expressions on this class right now that you like, you can write them down. You can put them in Anki. But what I would recommend here is that don't, don't just put the word on one side of your Anki card and the definition on the other. What I encourage you to do to make this more effective and to be able to use Anki to help solve this difficulty is to write a full sentence or to collect a full sentence from a native speaker, ideally, or get a native speaker's comment on that sentence. Put a full sentence in your Anki. So you could say, you could, you could put the Spanish definition on the front and then the English on the back that you're trying to put your connection into or your, your expression into. But the point is use a full sentence for these Anki cards. Don't just put one word, one definition. Because again, one word, one definition, your brain thinks that's boring. But if you can show it, hey, this is a useful expression that I can use in a complete sentence, that's going to be more effective. So if I've understood correctly, Kevin, we need to put it in context, in a sentence exactly. in context, if I've understood correctly. Exactly. Okay. Let's take a stab at the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So this is my last one. And so take a stab at something means to try to do something that you're not completely sure how to do. So 
Um, if Craig asked me, hey, can you um, uh, write me a script for my next podcast? I might say, well, I've, I've never been on your podcast. I don't know exactly what you want to talk about, but sure, I'll take a stab at it. I will try to do it. And when we say take a stab at something, it also implies, yeah, we're going to kill someone. No, we're, we're not killing anyone. Um, but it means that I want feedback on this thing afterwards. So yeah, I'll take a stab at writing your next podcast episode, Craig, but I need you to review it first and, and to tell me if it makes sense, if it fits your format, whatever. And so an example sentence might be if I'm in a meeting and I'm talking about those action items, those tasks that I need somebody to do, I might say, hey, Sarah, since you used to do this at your old company, could you take a stab at the first draft of our grant application? So I'm asking this person, Sarah, to try doing something that I think she has some experience with, but I know it's not her, her strength. I know it's not something she knows how to do perfectly. And I'm implying that we are going to review it together later and give some feedback. Okay. Um, let's move on to my last one, which you may have... Um... You may have come across this before. To come across is a phrasal verb, which means you may have seen this before. It may be familiar to you, but I want to remind you of it because I think it's very, very useful. I think it's underused by many students who tend to say, um, can I use your pen or even could I use your pen? But would you mind lending me your pen is a lot more polite, especially in a business context. Now, the thing with this um, expression, would you mind, is if you put a verb after it, it must be a gerund of an ing verb. Example could be, would you mind confirming that by email? That often happens if you have a telephone conversation, you want something in writing from the person or from the client. So would you mind confirming that by email? So any verb must be with the gerund. Would you mind um, collecting me uh, at six o'clock or would you mind picking me up from the airport? To pick someone up is to take them in the car. Uh, would you mind postponing the meeting? And let me ask you something. Postponing the meeting, to postpone. Do you know the phrasal verb for postpone? If you do, please write it in the chat. What is the common phrasal verb? that means to postpone something, to change the date so that it's later. So make hey, sure Craig, you use the gerund with that. Would you mind inviting me to another live class in the future? <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Um, and to your point about the apps, maybe we could speak about apps because I know you've, um, you've spoken about apps before. I think I remember a blog post or a video about popular YouTube apps video. that students use that would be uh would you mind speaking about that in the future I would, love, I would love to let's do it let's do it so would you mind do we have anybody with the phrasal verb no although christine does have a sentence with stab what's the difference between give it a shot and take a stab at something then um i think they're very similar aren't they kevin i'd say they're similar uh, i think they're very similar but i think it the usage is going to change. Like if I say give something a shot, I'm usually I'm usually just ending the sentence there. So Craig might say, "Hey, can you write this script for me?" And I'll say, "Sure, I'll give it a shot." Period. Right. Yeah. But if we were going to specify, if we're going to say exactly what we're going to try doing, then that's when I might use take a stab at. So yeah, I'll take a stab at writing that script. I'll take a stab at um, you know thinking of our next topic. Um, but give it a shot to me at least is more of something, a quick reply after somebody asks me something versus take a stab at, I can provide a little more information after it if I want to. Thank you for that explanation, Kevin. So nobody has um, told me the phrasal verb for postpone. It is to put off. I've just put um, it in the chat. So again, it must be the gerund. Would you mind um, putting off the meeting until next week. Make sure you remember that, Joan. And of course, if you do mind, if you don't want to do it, the answer is yes. So if you hear the answer, no, that means it's okay. Would you mind confirming that by email? No, not at all. Or no, I'll do it tomorrow. But if you hear the answer, yes, then the person does mind. 
yes, it is a problem. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, the good news there is I think if people do have a problem with it, they're going to say more than just yes. Like they will explain why it's a problem. So don't feel like it's, oh my God, I need to remember which way it is. It, it'll be pretty clear, I think. Um, but yeah, if the answer is no, then that means it's good. Like, no, no problem. Yeah, let's do it. So Kevin, we're, we're nearly uh, at the end. Would you mind going back to the beginning and we can quickly run through and look again at the expressions we've uh, we've looked at today? Let's do it. Okay. This was the first one. Okay. First one was, why don't we table that for now? And again, that just meant to delay talking about something until a future time. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I'm afraid I didn't catch that. Can you repeat it? Can you say it again? Okay. Let's take this offline. That means that we need to talk about something privately instead of on a big meeting with lots of people watching. Can I come in here? is when you want to interrupt somebody politely and you want to say something, remember to wait for that. <gasps> and then you say, can I come in here? And then you, you say what you want to say. In the interest of time is a good way to make a suggestion about what we're going to do next in a meeting if we're running out of time or if we just want things to continue to move quickly so this meeting doesn't take forever. Could you please clarify? Could you please repeat what you've said, maybe in a different way? You want clarification. You want to make sure that everything is clear. So you're, you're asking for clarification. To your point is a way to make a reference to something somebody said in the past in this meeting, and then to agree with it and add additional information. If I've understood correctly, that's where you're summarizing, you're paraphrasing what you've heard just to check the information to make sure that you have understood correctly everything that's been said to you. A very useful expression um, so that there are no misunderstandings. And then to take a stab at means that you are going to try to do something that you don't know exactly how to do and that you want some additional feedback or opinions from other people after you do it. And finally, would you mind um, when you ask somebody to do something is a nice polite expression. Just remember to use the gerund, whatever verb you use, make sure it's an ING verb. Would you mind coming back, Kevin, and joining us in another live stream? Not at all. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So thank you very much for um, keeping us company, everybody watching. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to Kevin as well for joining us today. It was really, really good fun. Before we go, just to remind you that Kevin can be found at deliberateenglish.com. And um, Kevin, just quickly say, for if anybody wasn't here at the beginning, what you do over at deliberateenglish.com. Sure. So again, my focus is to help people build confidence. I want you to be able to speak confidently at work or to help you confidently apply for that next job and look for something that can be a better fit for your life both financially as well as mentally. And so at Deliberate English, I help people with topics like voicemails, interviewing, um, dealing with angry clients, professionally and politely saying yes or no to things. And if you go to deliberateenglish.com right now, you can grab a copy of my free ebook, uh, Three Steps to Confidently Express Yourself at Work, where I start to teach you some of the techniques and strategies you can use so that you can be a confident English speaker and remember all the vocab you're learning in a real conversation. Okay. Did that come up on the screen when I shared my screen there? It did. I loved it. Well, <laughs> <Very nice. laughs> sometimes I, I surprise myself with the, with technology when it actually works. Um, <laughs> and I'm Craig from mentioningles.com where you can find uh, lots of material and lots of resources to improve your English for free. And also I want to tell you about a course that I'm starting soon over at EnglishMasterclass.net. It's a conversation course. It's going to last for six weeks. And I'll share my screen just for a second to show you the website. Um, go over there for all the information and you'll see um, the prices and it begins the 10th of May. And uh, if you want more information, 
to become a more confident English speaker, just put your, your name and your email in here and I will send you more information. So that's beginning on the 10th of May. It will be Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Central European time. And uh, I'd love to see you over there if you want to practice your English conversation. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. And I'll be back next week with Lynn. Um, same time, 8 o'clock next Wednesday. And I'm sure that Kevin will come back and join us again because it's been an absolute pleasure to, to do this stream with him. So thanks again, Kevin. And we'll see everybody soon. See you guys. Bye-bye.